Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we're so glad to have you joining us this evening. Um, I am really excited uh, to be with you as your behind the scenes host uh, and accompanying my good buddy, Holiday Simmons, for this wonderful Healing Justice webinar tonight. Uh, I'm Al Murray. I'm the Director of Organizational Development and Engagement at the Campaign for Southern Equality. And I'm also joined by our presenter, uh, again, Holiday Simmons, and our interpretation and translation team, Senzantle Language Justice Cooperative. Just so you know, slides in this presentation are in English and in Spanish. Uh, the Spanish slide will follow the English slide and Holiday will be advancing those uh, throughout the presentation. For simultaneous interpretation of the content uh, you're hearing with your phone, you can call this number and Holiday, if you would advance to the next slide there. Great. You can see the dial-in access number, the access code uh, there, and so that will be sim simultaneously uh, broadcast in Spanish. Uh, Senzantle team, do you have anything to add? All right, let me find Monse, do you have anything to add about how folks can dial in for simultaneous interpretation? Yes, I was trying to read, but I couldn't figure it out. But I'm gonna say in Spanish, just if folks are not on the line yet. Entonces, nada más para repetir, aquí en la página que están viendo en la pantalla, está el número de la línea de conferencia para escuchar al español. Entonces, si usted quiere escuchar el español, llama al número 605-313-5111. Y el código de acceso está ahí abajito, que es el 68041-441 numeral. Entonces, a ese número llamas para poder escuchar la interpretación en español. Y si llega a haber un segmento donde hacen preguntas si quieres hablar, um, lo puedes decir directamente al Zoom, al video, y no a la línea de conferencia. Esto solamente va a ser para escuchar. Okay. That's all I have to say unless Rocio wanted to add anything. No? Okay. All right. Thank you, Monse. Uh, if at any point you all have questions, I welcome you to use the chat function to type those in. I will have you muted and your videos stopped. Um, and at a certain time, at the end of the presentation, I believe Holiday is going to be asking some questions and taking some questions. Uh, so at that time, uh, when that happens, I will unmute everyone. Um, so just be mindful of that, that coming up. We'll give you a heads up first. Um, and with nothing else to say, I believe I have the great pleasure now of handing it all over to Holiday. Awesome. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Monte, and thank you, Sinzantle, for providing interpretation. Um, can, you, can you hear me well, Al? I'm yes, I can. Yes. Okay, great. I'm assuming if you great. can, then, then everything. <laughs> I'm assuming if you can, then everybody else can hear me. Yeah. Um, so uh, welcome folks uh, to the Old Southern Ways, um, this webinar uh, talking about this pilot project on LGBTQ healing justice in the South. Sio Ganali, Haude Simmons, Dakwa Doa, G Janali, Selagi, Janelle Atlanta, Utsda, it's good to be here. Hey family, my name is Holiday Simmons, uh, I come from Cherokee folks and black folks from the Mississippi Delta. And I currently live in Atlanta, former Creek territories, and I'm grateful for this platform to share these practices. I'm excited to hear about some of you all's experiments with uh, 
with healing justice and social justice and where the two combine. And um, yeah, I'm grateful for this time. So welcome. Um, who I am. Oh, oh, and so um, how this is going to work is um, we're just going to pause. Actually, let me let me move this bar a little bit. I think there's a there we go. Um, the as as Al mentioned, each slide will be in English um, and then successively in Spanish. Um, so I'll mostly talk on the English version and then I'll advance to the Spanish version and just have a moment um, so folks can can read the content. Um, who I am, you don't have to read that. I don't even know if y'all can see it with the way this screen is being shared, but um, essentially um, my role at the Campaign for Southern Equality, which I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the organization in a moment, um, is the resident in healing and resilience. Um, I never thought in all my life that <laughs> there would be, I would have a position with that title, um, resident in healing and resilience, uh, and that I would be able to um, support people's uh, activists and organizers um, uh, work around their wellness and their sustainability. So I'm, I'm ever grateful for this journey and I, I take it very serious. I'm very honored to have this position. Um, I previously come from an organizing background as well as um, sort of a trainer, uh, community educator background uh, for many, many years. Uh, the better, looks, it's looking like 20 years at this point, which is just wild. So there's that. Um, and I also uh, run a private somatics coaching um, mixed with a little bit of psychotherapy and constantly trying to uh, decolonize uh, practice. Um, and so finding new ways of, of what that term, mean, that term means for a one-on-one -on -one therapeutic practice. Um, and uh, also work with frontline organizers in uh, creating wellness spaces at uh, events and organizations. So that's a little bit about who I am. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, the objectives of what we hope to do today. And then I would love to um, hear who is in the space. We're gonna do a little interactive activity. Um, but let me offer this slide here in Espanol. And I know that um, interpretation is happening simultaneously. So I'm not gonna to stay too long on the Spanish um, slides here as long as I did when I was talking um, because I know that folks um, are hearing what I'm saying as well. Um, so today I hope that we um, are able to, we're going to share the history and the building blocks and learnings of this pilot project. Um, uh, it was a project that involved individual work as well as group work. And so we just want to share with folks a little bit about how that, how we built up to having this project, what it looked like, what some learnings from the project was, and uh, what it's going to look like moving forward or ways that we're thinking about it. Um, we're going to just a little bit explore the concepts of healing justice, embodied leadership, and resilience practices. I just wanted to um, presence those, you know, not just talk about the project, but talk a little bit about the content of what we're, what we're up to together um and share just a little bit of the content that we've we've been sh going over and exploring together and finally uh, about half the time will be an open discussion where you all can ask questions um and also I, I have a question for you all just in terms of who else is out there trying different experiments around healing justice and specifically its intersection with um social justice environmental justice racial justice movements so that's what our time together is going to look like. So at this point, let me share that in Espanol for a moment. And at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, so that we can have a bit of an interactive process. And then I'll come back to this, this uh, slideshow in a moment as soon as I figure out. Um, great. So um, if folks can, so um, we're just going to do a little roll call and see who's in the space as of yet. Um, I'm seeing about 20 people. Um, it says 26 six of us are our staff. So um, thank you for joining us. If you're just joining us, um, what you're going to do at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen, you'll see a lot of icons 
including your video, your, your audio. If you scroll to the middle, there's an <clears throat> icon that says Manage Participants. If everyone can click on that, um, and on your right side of your screen, you should now have a list of all the participants that um, are on this call. Um, if anyone is not seeing that, you can um, jump in, you can always jump in the chat. Actually, let me jump in the chat, make sure I'm not missing anything. Oh, I am missing things. They say, talk slower. Thank you. I will bring it down. Despacio, they said. Um, I will slow down my speech. Thank you. Um, so if folks aren't able to find that participant list, again, it's a link in the, um, the middle of your, the bottom of your WhatsApp, uh, not WhatsApp child, Zoom um, function, there's a link that says, uh manage participants you click on that you should be able to see everyone and so once you're in that um in the bottom left corner of that that screen where you see all the participants you should have a uh blue hand and if you see that, you can, everyone can just go ahead and click raise hand so I can just see that everyone's with me. Yes, keep it raised. Thank you, thank you. Keep it raised. Keep it raised. Uh-huh. Awesome. And some folks might be calling in by phone, so I don't know if it, if you're not on video, if you have that functioning. Cool. So if you're if you're just joining us, we're just asking you to go to the manage participants link, which is um, in the the task bar at the bottom of uh, Zoom. It's in the middle. It says manage participants. It should say 27. You click on that, you'll see the list of participants. Bottom left corner. Once you see that list, click the blue hand if you can, just to see if your hand raising is functional. Awesome, great. And now you can uh, lower your hand. You just click it again and it's lowered. So I'm gonna ask a series. We're gonna do a roll call. Shabuya, sha, sha, shabuya, roll call. Um, I'm gonna ask some questions. Uh, if these questions are a yes for you, you can just raise your hand. Please keep them raised until I uh, ask you to put them down and we're just gonna see who's in the space. Let me just pop over. Okay, folks are chatting in the chat box, nice, keep it popping. Um, the first question is, who in this space identifies? Okay, RJ Robles, um, if you could put your hand down, please. Thank you. Um, so uh, who in this space uh, lives in the South or identifies as a Southerner? Please raise your hand. Awesome, thank you. So majority of us either identify as Southern or live in the South, beautiful. And those who don't, bless your heart. Um, you can raise your, uh, you can lower your hands, please. Awesome, next question is, uh, how many folks in this space, um, let's get that last hand unraised. Denise Costa, por favor. I'll lower it. Oh, looks like I can lower it for y'all. This is some serious big brother functionality. Okay, next question is, um, how many folks in the space identify as some sort of wellness practitioner, healer, therapist, um, curandera, et cetera? Awesome, welcome. Thank you for your gifts. You can put your hand back down. Come on, Reverend Sex. I just like that name. Welcome to the space. Dirtbag, welcome. If you could put your hand down, that would be awesome. Or I can do it. Awesome, cool. Um, next question is, uh, how many folks in the space identify as organizers or uh, work for social justice organizations? If you're also a wellness practitioner, that's fine. Pretty much everyone, almost everyone. 
not El no, no, not Evermoss, everyone. Okay, a lot of folks. Thank you for that work as well. You can lower your hand. Um. Awesome. Next question is, um, how many people are um, also walking this path of um, either being in question or, or creating this bridge between healing justice and what we call healing justice, which we know is a timeless way of being uh, in the world, but the modern use of the term, uh, walking, creating this bridge between healing justice and social justice or climate justice, et cetera. How many folks here also in that question or creating that bridge? Mm -hmm. And wondering why there is a bridge, amen. Okay, thank you. You can put your hands down. or why there needs to be, I should say. Um, next question, and if folks could put their hands down for this one, for that last one, the next question, we're just gonna do two more, um, three more actually. Uh, how many folks in this space? Um, yeah, I would love, uh, so I think that, um, where healing justice folks, we often find ourselves in the company of the following people. So if you do, if you're engaged in the following work, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, food justice, childcare, uh, healthcare or plant medicine, disability justice, and transformative justice. If you're specifically involved in any of those, let me name them again. That's food justice, childcare, healthcare or plant medicine disability justice, transformative justice. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that work. Thank you for those intersections as well. You can lower your hand, thank you. Last question, but not least. Um, please raise your hand if you like Beyonce. This is real. Just, you don't, you know, we're not gonna come for you if you don't. It's fine, this is a safe place, this is a brave space, but we just wanna know. We just, a line in the sand. <laughs> okay, okay. Looking for my allies, not looking for the people who didn't raise their hand. <laughs> awesome, thanks y'all. So we're gonna go back to, um, I'm gonna go back to sharing the screen and back to our presentation so I can tell you a little bit about this project. Actually, hold on. Get out of that. Cool. So um, <clears throat> I'm gonna advance this, move this bad boy. Great. Okay. All right. So um Yes, great. So um, I'm thinking you all see my screen exactly, which means, damn, okay, there we go. So you can see the full slide. So um, who CSE is, uh, CSE Campaign for Southern Equality is a small um, kind of um, sophomoric organization, not super new, but also uh, not too old, eight years old, uh, relatively small, I'd say a small org. Um, we're 10 staff exactly at this moment. Um, I'd say multiracial slash majority right white. There's uh, six white staff people, uh, four people of color. We're based in Asheville, North Carolina, but we work regionally across the South. Um, and the mission is just working for the full equality of LGBTQ people in the South. Um, and that looks like um, some legal work. It looks like community organizing, um, community health program, rapid response and grassroots grant making program. Um, and fun sort of know your rights clinics and trans name change clinics that include um, sort of making a safety plan and a comprehensive way of being safe in the world outside of uh, you know legal transitioning and a ton of other programs I could uh, rave about um, out in the south is our is our um, 
sort of uh, resource guide for uh, LGBT friendly and especially trans friendly service providers. So that's a little bit about CSC. Um, this last point that I want to talk about um, is important because it, it's it's the basis for how um, I was invited in to do this work with CSC. Um, there was groundwork already laid uh, that that provided the platform for me to come in and start uh, working directly with people and in particularly in uh, using somatics, which I'll talk about in a moment, which is a, a pretty um, intimate healing modality. Um, I'd, I'd say more so than, than conversations and talk therapy um, and, and even just sort of workshop facilitation. So, um, so some of those things that CSE already had in play uh, included um, uh, full health benefits uh, without a premium, which means uh, staff does not pay in anything into their uh, health insurance policy, and that the policy includes services for mental health. Um, and there's also a professional development uh, funds and support given every, every year, every fiscal year for trainings, workshops, certifications, um, and that could, it doesn't have, it, it mostly needs to relate to your work, but also if you're like, hey, I want to start incorporating this other part of my work, um, I want to go to this training, it's, there's, uh, there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, as well as um, a technology stipend, if you, um, that, that could go to be in a stipend for your cell phone, um, every, or if you need to buy a new computer, that can sort of offset the cost for that. Um, it wouldn't buy it outright, it's not that much money, but it would be uh, a knock towards that. Um, and finally, the social wellness support uh, looks a variety of ways. It's um, uh, having staff wellness days, allowing staff to just have a day to go take care of themselves, having op optional social uh, gatherings. Now, I just wanna recognize that we say social gatherings. It's, I, I wanna uh, highlight the word optional. It, the, if you're not feeling safe where you work, you don't wanna meet them for cocktails, right? So, you know, I think that, uh, you know, leadership making space for staff to, to get to know each other as full people and especially outside of the work environment is super important. Um, and um, not uh, making that a mandatory, but also even like a, a social pressure. So you say it's not mandatory, but then you sort of passive aggressively be like, well, since you didn't come to the barbecue, you know, so I do wanna underscore that like optional uh, social uh, uh, gatherings is is important. So those were some of the things that were already in place. Um, and here's that same slide in Spanish. <clears throat> By the way, this is all going to be uh, this whole webinar is recorded, so you all will have access to these slides and this whole conversation. Uh, what it looked like was I actually started off as a consultant, a six month consultant, and then it uh, morphed into a staff position at half part time, 20 hours a week um, and with benefits. And but the work did not change. Um, it was just sort of a shift in my role um, that I just wanted to share uh, and be transparent about. But the work looked like since August. So we're right on the year mark, which is why we're doing this sort of pause and reflection period. Um, so since that time, we've had four three-hour-long uh, staff, all staff workshops, um, and there were somatic workshops in that um, they were in part sort of talking about things and also actually practicing um, uh, movement practices um, that come from a somatic framework. I do believe I, I will share in a moment what somatics is for people who are like, what is this word you're talking about? or I've heard this, but I'm not exactly sure what it is. I think I, I will take a moment to explain it. If it's not in the slides, I'm happy to say it during the question and answer. Um, so uh, most of the staff did opt in to receive one-on-one -on -one somatic coaching. I think that, that uh, oh, the one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, was uh, once a month, roughly once a month. Uh, it actually ended up being every two to three months, uh, but it was op that was optional and most of the people opted in, but not everyone. I probably need to slow down. Let me check my chat box, y'all. There's, there's multiple things happening here. Okay, I'm gonna slow down. Um, and so each person has, since that time, has received an average of about 
five one-on-one -on -one sessions. Some people more who I was able to meet with once a month. Some people who, you know, our schedules didn't meet up. It would be less than that. And here's that same slide in Spanish. So what is healing justice? Um, why are we doing this? Um, I want to quote from my dear kindred, <laughs> pun intended, kindred as of Kindred Southern Healing Justice Collective and kindred as in my kindred, um, comrade, friend, Kara Page. Um, healing justice identifies how we can holistically respond to, respond, not react, and intervene on current and generational trauma and violence and to bring collective practices that can impact and transform the consequences of our oppression on our bodies, our hearts, and our minds. Each of these words, I wish we had time to break down because they're each, this is a very intentional statement. Um, holistically is an important piece of that. Um, let me see if I can move my list. Pointer, holistically is an important part of this. Um, uh, current as well as generational trauma is an important part of this definition. Uh, trauma and violence. Um, uh, collective practices is an important part of this definition. Um, and then transform. So each of these, I, I wish we had time to sort of break this down. But um, this is what we mean when we use that term now. And uh, I just want to give props to Care Page for her work in this movement and for, um, for everyone else out there who, um, who's, who's been a part of this um, concretizing what we've been doing for a long time and, and giving it a shape and a name. Ashe. Let's talk resilience realness. So why resilience? My title is the resident of healing resilience. Why are we talking about resilience in the context of a social justice organization, um, an LGBT organization, a Southern organization? Porque hablamos de la resiliencia. Um, resilience, I, I'm giving this definition. Um, as from generative somatics who I've done a lot of, most all of my practices, not, yeah, most all of my practice, somatic training and practices with. Um, but before I actually, we read from this, um, I just wanna say, I think re resilience is a both overused and underused and misused term. Um, it can be overused as a, a cop out to mean, um, to sort of, uh, uh, provide an alibi for not showing up to people like, oh, the people in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, you know, FEMA didn't come, but they're so resilient. You know, the people in Pine Ridge, they're so resilient, this type of thing. That's not what we mean. That's a misuse of the term. Um, it also doesn't mean sort of like, um, you know, like a quick fix, or it also just doesn't mean self-care. And it also just doesn't mean self-care added with community care. Um, so I want to say less about what it isn't um, after those disclaimers and just give what part of what I believe it to be, which is the ability to somatically, we can also say holistically, so in mind, body, um, emotionally, you know, uh, sensory wise, respond to and renew ourselves, respond to and renew ourselves during and after trauma. Resilience is as automatic in us as our survival responses to trauma. We can learn about our own or community-centered resilience strategies and practice them consciously in the process of healing. All a process. And in Spanish. So the long and short of it is, um, if we're not talking about healing and resilience, um, unfortunately, we'll often uh, repeat the same, re behaviors and ways of being and showing up uh, as the systems and the people who we're trying to dismantle. And if we even uh, show up to being able to do that and repeat them, 
if we don't show up, it could be because we burn out before we get there. Um, and so CSE wanted a way for their, essentially for their staff uh, to be more embodied in their individual selves and for the collective uh, whole as a staff, as well as an organization to avoid burnout and implosion or explosion. Some of the things we talked about were um, as it relates to resilience is coping versus resilience. Also just want to name, I'm a Libra y'all. Okay. At least in my sun sign. So it's a, most things are about a both and for me. So it's not like, Ooh, you do this and that's coping, shame, shame, shame. And then you do that and that's resilience. When you drink all the time, that's a coping strategy. But when you have that glass of wine, then that's resilience. It's not that cut and dry. We all gotta do what we gotta do um, to keep going sometimes. And about all of it, there's no shame, no judgment, no bad. Um, what we're trying to do is uh, first just pause and figure out what are we feeling? Where are we feeling it in our bodies? How are we responding to pressures? How are we making requests of the world? How are we handling requests of the world? And where can we be more centered in that? Where can we give ourselves more, sh more choice? So that's, that's what our work together look like. But some of the content look like talking, discussing coping as uh, numbing and escaping, whereas resilience presences and incites more feeling. Uh, coping as in further contracts the body like this and resilience helps release contractions. We talked about coping as an unintentional maintaining when you don't know actually what you're feeling or what you're doing in response to your feelings versus uh, intentional sustenance, you know, um, intentional being the main word there. We talked about coping as in breaking connection, sometimes with ourselves and as in dissociating, as well as connection with others, connection to a project. And we talked about resilience as in seek, it seeks connection. It, it seeks to, to share, to hear, to be heard, to listen and to share. Um, we talked about coping as in often things we do to survive. And again, no shame, no, no, no judgment. And we talked about resilience as fortitude. So not just surviving, but moving towards thriving. So why resilience now? To balance our pain with possibility and even with pleasure. We know, you know, I think most everyone in this call uh, said that they're in the business of addressing their pain or someone else's and and either that whether that be on a uh, sort of direct service a direct holding of space or on a more macro political uh, shifting paradigms and systems and policy level um, so while we're doing that essentially we're doing this pain work right we're doing this balancing out the imbalance work um, how about we do that with possibility of others? So not just what we're breaking down, but also what are we, what, how much time and energy are we spending on what we're creating and what we're headed towards for the sake of what, if you will. And then not just what we're headed towards, but can we enjoy it? Can we have a little pleasure up in this bad boy at the same time? Please and thank you. Why resilience now? To thank our ancestors, our ancestors, our femcestors. Um, our Black sisters, our Indigenous sisters, our Latinx sisters, um, and all our other sisters um, for getting us to this point. Resilience work is also about reflection, acknowledgement. Why resilience now to build a counter narrative about our existence that gets back to our, you know, what are we, why are we doing this fight? Why are we doing this? Why this campaign? Why this uh, project? Why this program? Why this transformation? Why this healing for the sake of what? What are we really trying to do with our lives, with our species? We trying to change places with the oppressor? No, thank you. I want no parts of it. Um, because the world needs us. Why resilience now? Because we are fabulous. We're Southern. We're queer. We're trans. Uh, we're children of the rainbow and the sun. 
and truly, uh, for me, it's not a narrative of fitting into, of being included, you know, it's, uh, it's that we have so much to teach the world and that the world very much needs us to complete the circle. So that's why. And embodied leadership. So we also went over embodied leadership. Um, and uh, this is uh, a quote from, I could give my own definition. I wanna just quote uh, the person who sort of like coined the term and the ways that I've been uh, introduced to it, which is uh, Richard Strozzi of uh, Strozzi Institute of Embodied Leadership. Embodiment is when your actions consistently reflect your values and your commitment, especially under pressure. When you stay embodied under pressure, you become an inspiring leader in your personal life and in your team. So I'm not a huge fan of the, the last little twist about like, you know, doing it for your work. I don't know. There's just a little bit of like nonprofit industrial complex language in there. But the point I think that he's trying to make is for yourself and for whoever you care about, the people who you're around, less about the nonprofit language. Um, I think that's what he's really talking about. Um, so we talk about in somatics, um, this, this um, range of action from 300 to 3000. It takes you 300 times of doing something to uh, have muscle memory. So surveying a tennis, um, hitting a baseball, typing without looking at the screen, putting your car, putting your seatbelt on every time you get in the car, muscle memory. Embodied memory takes about 3,000 repetitions of doing the same thing, which means even under pressure, so even if you're upset when you get in the car, you still automatically put your seatbelt on. Even when the sun's in your eye or it starts to rain or there's like, you know, racist fans and you're Serena Williams, there's racist fans or linesmen, um, can you still do that same serve? That's, that's the um, embodied part. So we actually think about, I actually think about um, transformation in terms of embodying new ways of being and responding to things um, as what if Serena Williams continued playing at her caliber, caliber of play, still had that wicked serve she had, um, but all of a sudden she start serving with her other hand, her left hand. And as far as we know, she's not ambidextrous in that way. So imagine she shows up to Wimbledon. Y'all think she about to serve in volley like always, but now she's practicing with her non-dominant hand. That's what taking on new actions and, and you know, um, personal transformation that leads to how you show up in movements uh, really is like. Um, and it's, 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 it's much more than sort of like what you can say you want to do, um, but then your body is saying that you're, and your behaviors are saying that you're doing something else. Again, no judgment, no bad. Um, we're all on this process of having our, our, our practices and our behaviors um, be aligned with our values and what we say uh, we care about and what we say we're trying to do um, with ourselves and with our movements. So that's the embodied leadership part. So I just want to share um, just about at the end of uh, this presentation and almost getting to the question and answer part. But I, you know, as um, I think for many of us, unless you do a lot of, a, a lot of folks who are uh, doing healing justice work or, you know, transformative justice work, or even in some, to some extent, social justice work, um, our metrics uh, can be a little tricky uh, as in how we're measuring uh, our impact. You know, um, if you're a lawyer, you either win a case or you don't. If you're a firefighter, you either fight the fire and save lives or you don't. Or, you know, I'm sure there's some middle ground, you know, save some, but maybe you lose some. Um, sorry if that was morbid for anyone, if that was triggering. Uh, but, you know, if you're doing uh, like all this stuff we're, we're talking about, uh, deep transform, if you're, you know, is the measure when Serena like gets it over the court 
<laughs> or is it when she gets it in or when or is it that when she gets her serve as good as when it was right-handed right so the measurement of transformation can be and in even like for our, our for our movements as well as for ourselves um and our group dynamics is it can be a little tricky so um at the end of the day i was like okay this was a cute project but um how are y'all being impacted so um i wanted to share what some of the staff said and uh, apologies um for our um interpretation um as well as the written translation team um we don't have these slides in spanish but we we will definitely get them um to you all so um one person said um, so the question was just, yeah, how have you been impacted by the work? And one person said, I, I have more tools to use to navigate conflict, praise God, and the stressors that are part of doing LGBTQ work in the South. The somatic practices we've learned help you name and understand what's happening at the physical and emotional level rather than just reacting. Just want to uh, pull out some of these things. Um, the naming and the understanding what it's happening. This person didn't say fix things, shift campaigns, uh, you know, start a whole new initiative. This is like, you know, on the scale of like what a grant might want to see, this is like micro shift, right? I, I think it's huge to be able to be like, boop, boop, what's happening? Let me name it. Let me see what's happening in my body. And now let me just, uh, take action from, um, from a centered place. Um, but again, just being real about like what this work looks like. Um, this isn't like from this, we now have a whole new position or we have, um, we're no longer racist or like some major shift um, that I think the quantifiable, uh, sometimes grant-based, sometimes sort of, um, Western white supremacist patriarchal ways of knowing and um, and uh, measuring things calls for. So I'm just giving that scale, and I think this is huge. Um, moving on, another way it impacted another person said it's helped me a lot to know my shape, and I'll say what that is in a moment, and tendencies, so I can notice that and make my response more of a choice. Again, with this choice for the context and the situation. Okay, take it all in rather than just an unconscious reaction. For any neuroscience geeks out there, this person is talking about reactive, in a moment of a trigger probably, as we call trigger or discomfort, um, rather than just acting from that amygdala, that um, you know, vagus nerve shaping part of the brain, they were able, they were stopped, paused, and were able to come back to those uh, executive functioning, that neocortex, that rational thinking, uh, and I'm not saying ration is better than like feeling. Don't y'all don't hear me on that. But the person was able to center, come back, and be like, "Oh, what's the situation? What am I feeling? What's the situation? How do I move?" So you know, my next question would be, how has that been uh, interacted, uh, impacted your interactions with your coworkers or your family? But I didn't ask all that, but you know, in time. Last thing I'll share, impact of the work. This person said, I'm learning to be more in tune with my body and all of the stress trauma it is holding. In professional environments, we are taught to lock away our stress, oftentimes storing it in our physical bodies, in order to be a more productive worker. Working with you and somatics experience therapy overall helps me to honor that pain I carry every day so that I can keep doing the various work that I choose to do. Uh -oh. um, again, just that, that pausing, that noticing, that moving from choice. Um, so I, I, I feel very grateful um, and re re uh, resonant, relevant, no, have a lot of respect. Rev, child. I can't think of the word, but I feel very respectful um, to, to receive this feedback. So, um, oh, I'm not quite done. I'm ready to hear from y'all. Lessons from year one, here we go. As I mentioned, CSE already had a foundation of being worker-centered. Um, in terms of the one-on-one -on -one work that was optional, 
the executive director led by example. So uh, she actually had her session first and was able to excitedly share with staff uh, how that felt. Um, I don't know if it actually encouraged staff. I don't think staff was necessarily hesitant, but I know it did sort of uh, set a tone and uh, she sort of led by example. Um, uh, it helped that we had a majority of staff buy-in in terms of doing the one-on-one -on -one work. Um, time, oh, time was a contender for the group sessions. Yeah, the group sessions, um, because they were every two to three months, um, and as I mentioned with embodiment, it takes practicing these somatic practices over and over again. Um, we only practice them in the group a couple times a year, so there was a lot of review and repracticing before I could introduce new practices. Um, so, um, yeah, I, we always wanted more time. I think this is always the case for all the things we do ever. Um, being flexible and nimble with curriculum and, and the healing process. Yeah, there were staff shifts. People left staff. People joined staff. Um, catching people up. Dealing with the fallout of staff leaving. Um, I had like a whole year-long curriculum, and I needed to be flexible and nimble um, with that. And and I'm and that's you know part of my principle to be sort of like person-centered. Uh, CSC staff was receiving this, so I want to respond to their needs. Um, but also, it just made for um, a better process um, outside of that being sort of um, a principle to live by. And finally, I just want to say that somatics is, it was a helpful modality because it, it is a, um, an embodiment and a body-based practice, but they, it is just one of many. Um, my training, as I mentioned, comes from generative somatics. Um, they do national programming. It also comes from bold, black orga organizing for leadership and dignity. Um, that's, we colloquially call that black somatics. Um, but there are other healing modalities. So I encourage folks who on the call who are other, other wellness practitioners to consider working with um, a social justice org um, in whatever modality that you do. Stay there for a moment. Awesome. <clears throat> and finally, plans for year two. Um, so I am, um, so we're, uh, CSC is also uh, spending time, energy, and resources specifically around racial justice as well as language justice. Um, so our partnership with Sinzontle, thank you uh, for being on this call. Um, it's an ever growing partnership that we just sort of concretize as uh, being like you know, not just a one-off, but we're, we're digging deeper with them and our language justice work as well. We have a racial justice consultant um, that we're working with. And so we're, we're, we're playing around with how these all overlap. Um, we will continue with the individual one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I skipped ahead. Um, I'm gonna be providing staff um, individual assessments as well as the whole group in organizational assessment. Um, this is not a evaluation or a progress report. Um, it's a way of, it's actually a consensual. They first have to consent to receiving one. And then I tell them, um, yeah, just how I feel like, um, uh, yeah, what they name me, what they name to me to be what they care about and what they're working on and what they wanna transform. And what I see, how I see them actualizing that, um, where I see their growing edges, where I see them like, excelling and what it could look like moving forward. Um, uh, we're gonna take a pause on the group sessions. There's one more group session, but now we're gonna, this was like the first year of doing internal staff uh, uh, inward facing work. And now we're gonna start doing external uh, outward facing work and we're just in public facing work and we're uh, just figuring out which programs of some of the ones I mentioned earlier, I uh, am gonna be bringing this work to.
And then finally, uh, the last thing I want to say before we uh, I stop sharing my screen and we open it up for questions um, is that um, I'm offering if for if there's folks who are interested in doing a similar project or partnership, if you're from a, a nonprofit or even if it's not nonprofit and it's just um, some sort of coalition. Um, that is, you know, climate justice, racial justice, social justice, and you're looking to incorporate healing justice and want some um, guidance and technical assistance on ways to do that. Um, or if you are a um, wellness practitioner and wanting some guidance on ways to specifically uh, work with an org that you've been volunteering at or care about, um, I am offering some one hour consultations please email me at that email that you see there, holiday at southernequality.org. Um, if you're interested, um, I don't, if all, however many people are on this call, which I, I don't know just yet, I'm gonna, until I stop sharing my screen, if everybody's interested, I don't have that capacity, um, but I'm just gonna see what the full amount is and at that point determine if that's gonna be a, a separate call with a small group of us or if that'll be a one-on-one -on -one session. Um, but either way, um, uh, yeah, open to that beyond this call. You can share exactly who you are, what you're doing. Um, show me what you're working with, essentially. Um, in, the, in the immortal words of Mystical, show me what you're working with. And not the way Mystical meant it, though. Anyhow, um, thank you for listening. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and open it up for questions. Thanks, Holiday. Uh, so at this stage, y'all, as Holiday is unsharing the screen, uh, you all have the option of unmuting yourselves. So if you would like to ask the question verbally, you have the ability to click your little microphone button uh, that has a little red line through it and unmute yourself. And you can ask that. Or if you prefer, you can send it via chat and you are welcome to type your question. Uh, so I see one from Cynthia Renfro. Can you say a little bit about the definition of somatic practice and will the slides be available? The slides will be available, yes. And cool, and just, yeah, absolutely. Um, just for clarity on that, the, you're, uh, Cynthia, you're referring to the slides, um, uh, the translating those those last three sides in in into Spanish, or are you asking about slides about what a somatic practice is? Just for clarity, and I will answer what a somatic practice is. Um, yeah, I'm really just asking what is somatic practice. Cool. Um, so yeah, uh, I turns out I didn't include slides around that. Sorry about that. Um, it, uh, so somatics is it's a it's a theory of change as well as a healing modality. Um, that the theory of change part is a, a way of, of viewing how, um, how to get to liberation, essentially, which is through the integration of um, um, individual work, uh, collective, also a collective work at the same time, um, and um, connecting that with larger social justice things as compared to sort of like, you know, my, my original background is psychotherapy and it's very sort of like you centered versus like, no racism also is trauma. You know, we, we kind of see like these individual like, you know, childhood abuse is like a trauma and racism is an oppression. But like, so a thematic sort of, um, uh, theory of change in, in terms of like the theory of change portion of the definition is sort of like both of them impact the body and impact person a person's uh, uh, ways of being whole and ways of like heading towards uh, towards their their and their movements definition of liberation the specific healing modality and what I mean by uh, portion of that definition and what I mean by practices is um, it incorporates um, a uh, a few uh, things so a stillness 
meditation, which I am awful at doing, P.S., y'all. Um, a, a Joe Kata practice, which uh, is coming from Aikido. It involves a, a wooden uh, stick, essentially, but it's, that stick is called a Joe Kata. And so there's a, uh, there's, uh, you work with this sort of martial arts aspect. Um, um, and then uh, a, a centering, uh, which is kind of like, again, a practice that folks have been doing for time in memorial uh, in terms of coming back to themselves. But the way that it's sort of facilitated in the somatics framework is it's a particular way that centering is, is facilitated um, and that relates to um, being in your dignity, being in connection with others and setting boundaries and having like a range of, of, of emotion. Um, and then the other aspect is this, the centering that I just mentioned is the baseline that it creates the building blocks for all these other, when I say practices, they're literal moving practices where like um, I, I come up, you know, you know, with consent, they're almost, you know, you can almost picture it like theater games sometimes, um, but you're, you're plugging in real content from something you're working with in your personal life or your work life. And it gives your body and your nervous system the opportunity to, at whatever level you want of from minor to major, sort of relive what that pressure feels like um, and see what happens and give your, chances, uh, your body a chance to be like, oh snap, I feel like I wanna run away right now. Or oh snap, I feel like I wanna punch this person. Or oh snap, I feel like I'm gonna just, I'm not even here anymore, I've just escaped. Um, and then give you choice, you know, noticing what happens and then practicing, let me um, actually not run away or let me actually not hit this person, you know? Um, so the practices are literal sort of movement based for all bodies, um, things uh, that serve that purpose. So I hope that I've explained that um, it, uh, well. And if you have follow-up questions, um, I'm happy to hear them. Um, I wonder also, um, Al, if you have the capacity, um, thank you so much, Al, for holding down the web functioning, um, to link the uh, blog that was recently, uh, that I recently wrote in the chat window, um, because I think that explains somatics and it actually links to generative somatics that who can explain it even better, just so folks um, who are unfamiliar can have a follow-up definition. Um, thanks for the question. And thank you, Al, for doing that. Um, let's see, um, question from Asha Leong. Hey, boo, um, long time comrade, also uh, just all around dope person. How can we encourage more organizations to make healing justice a funded organizational priority? That's a great question. So I actually asked the ED, um, you know, uh, how, did you, what did you, did you have to forego, um, I mean, always right so it's it's always a matter of priority i think that the question um shouldn't be is x a priority whatever it is in this case we're talking about healing justice it could be something else um so much uh or not so much like do we not so much like a question of do we have the budget to do this but or um how much are we willing what like uh, do we want to prioritize this, in other words, right? So I think that um, there was definitely something uh, I asked, like, was there something that was, um, that had to be not prioritized in prioritizing the healing justice work? And how did that process go? And it sounds like um, it was a slow buildup and a collective process among staff and the board to get to each step in some of those things that I mentioned around the benefits, around the premium, around the uh, staff time off, around the um, <clears throat> uh, professional development that slowly led up to, hey, how about now let's enter with a consultant? And then how about now let's make this person staff? Um, I wanna say that no matter where your org is or your, your formation is, um, if you're smaller than 10 people um, and uh, transparency, CSE's budget for fiscal year 2019 is 800K. So that's just shy of a million. Mid-size, I'd say, mid-size budget. Um, if, you're, if your budget is far less, um, there are ways that you can do this with what you got. 
Um, you can do exchanges. You can do just start with like a wellness day. You can uh, just have a one time thing. You can do um, you can embed it into a grant that's already happening. Uh, you know, if you have a fellowship, you can say, hey, I want to provide one on one sessions um, with all the fellows for just a six month fellowship or a one year fellowship. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of ways you can do it that can be aligned with what your organization's capacity is. It's just a matter of um, uh, if they want to do it, you know? And so I think that's the bigger question of getting real with like, um, this would not be work that uh, would feel good if most staff were not uh, committed and invested. Like somatics, Girl, you asking my feelings and you trying to like put your hand on my heart, quite literally, that's a practice, hand on heart. And I am most, almost half, uh, a good number of staff are, are trans also. So we're doing all these like body practices. Um, people were already sort of like open to it. So I think beyond like how to make it uh, a financial priority, um, I think there would need to be deeper conversations around why heal? you know, back to that, like, why resilience? Um, what's, what's at stake and, and uh, for the sake of what? And, and having the folks you're working with get really clear um, and everybody sort of in sync about that and, and then seeing, you know, what the actual capacity is. Thank you for that question. Um, Question from Zenlara. Thank you. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Let me read it. I'm supporting organizers and facilitators and queer community in Atlanta in transformative justice right now. Ashe, thank you for that work. And healing is becoming more clearly an important part of supporting accountability and consequences in community. But I'm thinking about how do you talk about who deserves healing? Woo! Just ask a huge question, why don't you? Um, it's a great question. Um, let me make sure I understand it. Um, right. Um, I, and also, um, feel free to come off mute. If I'm going to uh, reflect what I think your question to be, and if I have it wrong, feel free to unmute and, uh, and, and clarify for me. So I think what I'm hearing you say is in doing um, uh, response to harm in a transformative justice framework, it's not just about addressing the harms, but actually the healing work that's a part of that and quite possibly the longest part, the longest uh, and more sort of in-depth part of that work is not just the, the space that may be held between people who are doing harm and being harmed, but actually supporting uh, one or both of those parties um, outside of the actual harm that was done, outside of the actual incident um, and, the, and the actual healing work that's there. Um, and then within that, who deserves healing? So um, is the question, what exactly is the question? Yes, yes, all of that is true. Okay, you said that's it. And so, um, so what's the question? Um, how to talk about who deserves healing? Um, Zen, are you able to? Yeah. Okay. It took me forever to figure out how to unmute on my phone. No problem. Yeah, I think that uh, the question for me right now is um, I very, it's very um, natural for me to find myself like being able to see the humanity and hold the humanity of people who have, who have done harm. Um, but when in space with people who have experienced harm and we start talking about like the the transformation that's required um so much of the things that are healing like we have this narrative of healing as a as a favor like it's like it's something that's a luxury um or that it's a kindness and it's really hard to be in space with people who have experienced harm um, and who are committed to justice um, but have a visceral response to seeing someone who's done harm supported in, 
in healing. Aha. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, that's a really um, brilliant point and question. So um, let me just say, um, whether it be, healing is not uh, easy at all. It is not cute. Um, doing it for yourself and supporting people doing it is not necessarily sexy work at all. It's not something you get a lot of um, uh, uh, public facing attention for. There are a lot of like, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations, private conversations, and most importantly, almost consistently, um, a certain level of confidential conversations. So it's not the like, I made that banner, I wrote these speech, I made these talking points type of work. Um, it's a like, uh, work that means dealing with our own and, and other people's shame, um, traumas, safety shaping, um, and it's not easy at all. So I just want to name that, and that's why I, I am like being really intentional about saying, folks on the call doing this, like kudos and gracias, because <laughs> I know I I want us to like keep talking to each other um, and make sure we're also supported, right? So, um, but in terms of deserve, who's deserving? Um, yeah, that is like one of the hardest things about TJ work um, is that main uh, transformative justice work is that main tenant that everyone has the capacity um, to be harmed and to harm, <laughs> right? And that we, if we're trying to create a world um, without borders and bars and cages, and we don't want to throw people away, that means we see people who have done harm starting to heal sometimes or still in space still in community still in relationships still dating right um and that impacts us as people being who have been harmed or people who are supporting people being harmed so that is so real um i think that it would be a whole nother conversation to talk about ways that i personally sort of deal with those things whether that be a running into someone or seeing something on facebook or just knowing that person is still thriving and i and they've harmed me and like, how do I find uh, forgiveness or how do I move forward? But to the extent of like supporting people who then have a hard time seeing someone who's harmed them. Um, I, first of all, it, it's helpful for me to know that um, you know, there's like, if there's an, there's an account, what we're talking about in the context of an accountability process happening and one not. If again, the accountability process has happened and they're like, okay, and then the fact that this person is still out there just like existing is hard, um, then that's just its own conversation. If it's about this person is not, or I'm not able to bring an accountability or they're not being accountable, then that's a whole nother conversation. And every, everyone does not need to hold everything. I do um, a lot of masculinity work and in my private practice, um, half of my clients are um, uh, men trying to transform their patriarchy. And some of those folks have come out of accountability processes um, where the people they've harmed do not need to see these people no more. And they don't need to hear about how they're healing. That's where I come in as a male identified person and I will hold that person for their fuck boy ways. I will be in that deep digging long-term process of embodied process of, um, you know, what was happening in your body when you didn't hear this boundary? What was happening when you um, co-opted the work? Like what's, what's really going on? Who hasn't heard your boundary? Who is co-opting your work? The person they've harmed doesn't need to hear that, right? Um, so if you're, the, if you're someone who's holding people harmed, I am also holding people harmed, um, and some of these men also have been harmed, of course. Um, then, you know, I think that that's about creating safety shaping. My short and my long, but then short answer is creating, uh, gener helping that person and generating safety uh, for themselves. And by safety, I mean not also like their physical self, but also sort of like what's theirs to hold and not, what's their work to do. Um, and, you know, where the wounds, you know, tending to their wounds outside of like this one uh, iteration of this person of this of a particular incident, in other words. So I hope that's helpful. I'm definitely down to talk more about it. I think it's really hard um, and super important. So thank you for that work. 
Um, thank you for this question. At the organizational level, after this question, we're actually going to pause, and especially because there isn't another one yet. And just if for anyone who isn't able to get in the chat box or isn't able to chat in a moment after I answer this last question, we're just going to unmute everyone in case anyone wanted to answer or needs to answer a question verbally um, and doesn't have the capacity to type. But let me just get to this one. Really quickly, yeah. Holiday, uh, Sandy just chatted me privately saying, I have a follow-up question. Okay. And I'm waiting to see if that is to the current question before we move on. Hey, Sandy? hey Al, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yes. It is a follow-up. That, um, that question hit home for me. Um, I've worked with gang members for a long time, and I've been recently asked to work with white supremacists. Uh -huh. And um, talking about who deserves healing, that, was a, that really hit home for me. And I've had to kind of do some soul-searching about my own issues and hang-ups with white supremacists. And um, so that, I thought that was a really great, great question. What I had to determine is if I could help them in any way to help get them out of that pattern they're in and that hate they're in, then they do deserve the healing. And that helps our community as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I thought, who, I forgot who asked that question, but I thought that is so true because sometimes I have a hard time thinking that they would deserve healing. Mm -hmm. and, and I have to put my own beliefs and bias in check. And that's sometimes hard to do. So. Yes, 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 yes. Um, Sandy, thank you so much. Um, um, I really appreciate just having other voices in the space besides my own, um, but also um, that, you're, that you're doing that brave work. And I actually think this is where I wanna see racial justice work or, or sort of uh, from white people. I wanna see more of that. Because when you say you've been asked to uh, work with white supremacists, to me, that doesn't mean just the KKK. That means any white person because um, <laughs> They're white supremacy and if you're white you're benefiting from white privilege and so you're exhibiting white supremacy in some way so doing that deep sort of whiteness work and privilege work um you know no different than doing sort of like deep you know masculinity vis-a-vis -vis feminism my, my masculinity work comes from being a feminist and now you know being uh, a man a feminist who's a man and i'm like um it's not my place anymore just to be up in the women's spaces having a voice like I'm there too but um, who's going to hold the people doing the harm accountable um, it doesn't need to be the people who are most harmed anymore you know what I'm saying so thank you so in that sense like absolutely like I'm not trying to I'm only I only have a certain capacity to hold um, any white people accountable for for their their racism to hold any cis person accountable for their um, cis centricism I only have a certain amount right I can do some um, where I need most of that work has to be for people who also um, benefit from those privileges. So, so thank you so much for that. And um, that's exactly where I want to see my, my personal plug for racial justice work for white people being more and having whiteness space. And it is not whiteness like we separate. Y'all separate anyway. So be separate and talk about y'all stuff. You know what I'm saying? So that's great. Um, praise you for that. And it, and it ain't easy. It is not easy. Um, so this next question, uh, at the organizational level, should racial equity and anti-racism work come first, or is this happening alongside the, the incorporation, uh, alongside the incorporation of healing justice work? How can we heal, especially in the room with a mixed group, when the root of the issue <clears throat> is truly anti-blackness? In honor of my need for all of my parts to be seen knowing that my identity and the fullness of me as a queer black woman has been weaponized. Um, thank you, uh, Cortina, so much for this deep and powerful question and share. First of all, I just want to name um, the hurt that I hear um, and, the, and the grievance and the, the pain and uh, just, yeah, I'm hearing that be, being named and um, anti-blackness and um, and your, your identities being weaponized in some way. Um, 
I, I want to speak to this in a moment, and then I, I would love for you to just chime in to say a little bit more about the last part about how it's being weaponized. But uh, first, um, let me just say in terms of like, um, which comes first, racial equity or anti-racism work along with healing justice. Um, I feel like there's something that feels like a little bit, um, like I can't quite answer the question because I find an issue with the question. Um, I think it's not about which comes first for me. Um, and I think, uh, like I said, being a Libra, there's both and. Um, any uh, multiracial organization, period, especially one that um, is majority white, even if that's only one more white staff person than, than the people of color, um, is, is going to have white supremacy is going to show up. Um, and anti-blackness in particular is gonna show up. Even if it was a black and brown, or like my other piece of work, a black and indigenous organization, anti-blackness gonna show up. Um, and then also, you know, in the case of like uh, people of color only, um, or other anti, you know, anti-immigrant uh, things might show up. Um, inv uh, indigenous invisibility might, does show up and might show up. So, um, and I think none of that is mutually exclusive from healing justice work. In fact, I mostly come th through healing justice, through a racial justice framework and from people who do that intersectional work. So I think I, I can't really answer to like which comes first. I also think you can be doing healing justice um, in a place that needs a lot of work around racial justice. Um, I think uh, places that are doing amazing racial justice can need a lot of work around their healing justice work um, and often do actually. Um, in other words, they're like dismantling all the aspects of anti-blackness um, and in terms of how they treat themselves and each other, it looks a lot like actual white supremacy. <laughs> so it's like, y'all ain't taking breaks. Y'all like, uh, you know, showing up to each other like cis straight white men. And yet the topic that you're talking about is dismantling anti-blackness. I've been part of those projects, you know what I'm saying? So I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive and I don't think that one necessarily needs to come before the other. Um, and I hope that I, I've answered that question. And um, let's see, uh, yeah, especially since we don't have another question on the queue, um, please, I would love if you're open to it, uh, Cortina, if you wanna chime in and just uh, say a little bit, if you wanna just add to that, and also, um, I wasn't clear on this part about how your identities as a queer black woman uh, about the weaponized part. Um, I know that's not the full extent of this call, but that's a big statement that I didn't want to go unrecognized. So welcome. Thank you. Yeah, you absolutely answered the question. Um, I think what was coming up for me was just this notion that, you know, around who, how do we determine who deserves healing? And I think sometimes without a racial equity analysis or even like, understanding how anti or how racism shows up or even that is something worth delving into and talking about that it would seem to me you know a little bit harder to to kind of further the deep work that you're talking about with healing justice um and and i know that a lot of my experiences in the past have been working at predominantly white institutions um and in those spaces just because of the nature of like of where I work, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think that that was definitely part of it. And it's it's helpful to hear that they happen simultaneously. And I think also mm -hmm. there's a part of me that just has this, you know, um, a little bit, Not I wouldn't necessarily say a, a full wound, but it's just like this awareness mm -hmm. that, you know, especially for me, what I meant by um, my identity being weaponized as a queer black woman is that you know, there's a lot of marginal, marginalization in my identity and in my experience, um, just in the in the different ways in which I move through the world. And, yeah. and I think that that's been part of my experience. And I think that when there are things that I'm really close to, um, as far as injustices, myself and a lot of my peers have experienced our passion as like anger or violence, you know, mm -hmm. or sometimes mm -hmm. there's solutions that are trying to be had you know, it's seen as like being being troublemakers. And so, you know, I'm just aware that <clears throat> we're talking about work that's gonna really take people to the edge of their vulnerability, which is great because I think that connection can happen and we do need to be recognized as holistic people in our workplaces and in our organizations. 
and I'm just aware, you know, that until we get past this notion that people who are most proximate to the issue can't be passionate about the, the rectifying of the issue that, you know, there are going to be challenges that come up even being in space where you're trying to share your feelings or do things um, in a different way and kind of process your emotions and move past it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cortina, for, yeah. Um, for, yeah, filling that in for me. And, and also just heard, seen, intuited, um, just about your experiences. Um, you are not alone on that. Yeah. Um, I, um, I think that, um, you know, again, part of the both and for me is that like, and, and also just transparency for me is CSE is um, um, my, the most that I work with white people. And so uh, all my other projects and formations and private uh, clients are all people of color, mostly black, Latinx and indigenous. Um, and um, it's, it is an exchange actually. It's um, choosing to uh, work in a multiracial organization that is predominantly white um, and is a part of my ex our exchange in, in being able to hold, uh, to hold that space with white folks is that I'm also growing because most of the staff is also from rural environments. Um, and um, many of the staff identify as having working class backgrounds and I identify as having a middle class background. And I, in my sort of like accountability work, I'm working on my class privilege and on my sort of like, you know, um, uh, city privilege. And, uh, and that relates to sort of like food justice stuff a little bit, but like, there's, there's a bit of a, a, a consensual share that's happening where like uh, I might be sort of, I might have some limitations for how deep um, the practice can go as compared to if there were a black org or a black and indigenous org primarily or only. Um, and I'm open enough to, to keep being transparent and to keep building because of that exchange around those other identities. That I, that I very much want to be accountable for. And that's not about a comparison, right, of, of those identities. It's just a sort of like, oh, how, when else do I get to work with like rural working class Southern trans people, white trans people in a deep somatic way. And it's like, you know, um, and, and, and also not to sound sort of like um, transactional in that, but really truly it feels like a share that we're all sort of being vulnerable in doing. Thank you. Um, and, and it does look different when you're working with people that you have shared background with. That's why there is black somatics. That's why there's bold. Um, that's why I'm still trying to like have a uh, decolonizing practice um, and, and, and recognizing that, you know, um, a lot of folks that come to me come with their own set of healing modalities, uh, you know, and their own like folks who are like Ifa Arisha priests are also coming. And so, um, coming for this type of work and so I, I want to just like you know um honor that there's like you know uh a both sort of like uh a deepening that could happen the more I might share and I think any sort of like counselor and social worker might uh relate to this the more identities you might share with your so-called clients or whatever um but that they're can be room for sort of like what they call in social work working across difference <laughs> um you know, um, with sort of like intention and being principled about it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I wanna pause here, especially cause there's no other questions in the chat and just um, ask my comrade Al if, um, thank you, if they could unmute everyone. If there's any folks on the call who um, we, especially in our last five minutes, wanna ask um, anything um, that they don't feel like or weren't able to put in the chat box. Um, now is your time. Okay, just as a, a warning, everybody's gonna be unmuted in five, four, three, two, one. So you can choose now to mute yourselves again, if you would like. Um, but this is so that you can speak openly if you're having a hard time um, messing with your controls. Yeah, so was someone saying something? A question? 
Just saying much gratitude, friend. Appreciate this webinar. Great to see you and doing the heart of your work. Thank you. Same to you. Peace and blessings. Go. Good afternoon. It was very useful, informative, woke. So good. Nice. Um, and who was that? Dean. Awesome. Welcome. And thank you. Thanks for your transparency on your process. Um, I think it's uh, hard sometimes as the leader or the, uh, the quote unquote professional. And I really appreciate your honesty, your transparency, and your vulnerability and the ways that you're growing. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, you know, just <laughs> to share feedback around the, uh, I think that there's another uh, organization that I'm on contract with and essentially that much larger, much more funded and it's national in scope. And they said essentially they had to figure out a way to tell their board that they want to hire a witch. So, you know, um, <laughs> you know, I think uh, some of this stuff is about like how you frame and package things. I think more than ever, uh, social justice orgs and nonprofits are wanting to incorporate wellness work beyond just like, you can call the employee resource line if you have an issue, you know. Um, so yeah, a lot of times it's just about like fra framing and naming and, uh, you know, prioritizing. Um, if there, I'll give one more openness for any final questions and otherwise, um, just a reminder that folks can email me, um, I'll put my, uh, actually Al, see, I can't even do that at the same time. Al, if you could put my email <laughs> in the chat window, um, if you do want a little bit more further, deeper digging, uh, some technical assistance around how to do um, a similar project or anything um, for yourself or your organization, just email me and um, we have some capacity for some one-on-one -on -one or some small group work. Um, and, but if there's nothing else, I thank you for your time. You could have been anywhere else in the world, but you chose to be with us. Thanks so much, um, Adam, who I see for holding it down with the, all this prep set up. And so much for Al for doing the um, managing of the technical things. Um, Sinzontle and Monse, thank you so much for interpretation as well as the written translation. Uh, we will get this recorded webinar out to folks. Um, and yeah, keep in touch. Um, Y'all got any final things, Adam or Al? All day, this is Sandy. Couldn't think of a more pertinent discussion to be having right now. So thank you so much for the work you're doing. Awesome. Thank you, Sandy. Thanks for you too. And just so you'll know, we will have Holiday's slide deck. Um, in addition to any other supplementary materials that Holiday would like to provide, as well as the chat texts, the um, translation and interpretation, the interpretation that is simultaneous and recorded via um, audio. Those will all be available in the same place on our website. And uh, Adam, will you be providing links? Yeah, so I'll send everyone an email in the next few days. Um, and by that, I mean maybe early next week with everything all together um, so that you don't get a million emails. Uh, you'll just have the one with, with uh, a clear link and everything all there. Um, but definitely reach out if there's something that happened on this uh, that you don't see included there and we can either point you in the right direction uh, or like find that for you. Cool. Oh. Thanks. Thank I want to say thank you, Holiday. Also as a member of the team who has benefited tremendously from the work that you do. Um, it's been a wonderful experience for us, and thank you so much for presenting it in the webinar form. Absolutely. Thanks so much for y'all's help. Take care, everybody.